Well, we see complexity everywhere. What about this idea of stasis? Here is a fossil shell on the bottom, and there's one you can pick up on the beaches today. Not much difference in all those millions of years, right? There's a sassafras leaf and a fossil leaf. Not even the veining has changed. Here's a dragonfly perched right on top of a fossil dragonfly. N not even the angle of the wing has changed. Where's all this evolution occurring? Here's a Denver Museum exhibit. The first sharks evolved 450 million evolutionary years ago. Sharks have changed very little over the years. No evolution. Coelacanth thought to have been extinct for almost 100 million years until they found out fishermen off the coast of Madagascar have been catching them and eating them for years. Stasis, not change. What about the distinct kinds? You know, evolution says there should be all kinds of links and transitions from one type of form to another type of form. Those transitions should be abundant. The museum should have hundreds of thousands of fossils. Why can't we find them? Because they are missing, right? You can't find them at all. All you have are end products and nothing in between. The missing links are still missing. Let me quote a couple evolutionists saying the same thing. First of all, there's David Kitts, who is an evolutionist. He's writing in the magazine called Evolution. He says, despite the bright promise that paleontology, the study of fossils, provides a means of seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious or famous of which is the presence of gaps in the fossil record. Then he says, evolution requires intermediate forms between species, and the study of fossils does not provide them. You know, if evolution is true, there should be thousands of things leading up to a fish in the fossil record. But as soon as you find fish, guess what? It looks like a fish, all right? Errol White was quoted as saying this, but whatever ideas authorities may have on the subject, the lung fishes, that's your great-great-granddaddy according to evolution, like every other major group of fishes that I know, have their origins firmly based in, what's that word? Nothing, nothing leading up to fish. And then as an evolutionist, he said, I have often thought how little I should like to have to prove organic evolution in a court of law. Stephen Jay Gould said it this way, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the what? Trade secret. It's the trade secret of paleontology. One other quote, Berlinski recently said, there are gaps in the fossil graveyard, places where there should be intermediate forms, but where there is nothing whatsoever instead. No paleontologist writing in English, French, or German denies that this is so. It is simply a fact. Darwin's theory and the fossil record are in conflict. Why don't they teach that to us in textbooks? Why do the textbooks say that fossils provide the best proof for evolution? And if it is the best proof, and they're saying it isn't proof, that doesn't leave much for the rest of the proofs for evolution, does it? I believe the fossils show animals were created after their own kind, and that's exactly what it states in the book of Genesis. After their own kind appears ten different times. Well, evolution predicts that we have constant change, lots of links, lowest life forms. Guess what? Resounding no in every one of them. The Bible predicts we're going to have complexity everywhere we look. There's going to be stasis, not change. We're going to have distinct kinds. And yes, that's exactly what we see.